I'm Scott Podolsky, and I want to welcome you all back to the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine seminar series. As we've discussed many times previously, our department and PIH both often focus on the relationship between the acute and the chronic. And that can pertain not only to pathology, but in a positive way to the novel uses and repurposing of existing informational and caregiving infrastructures. So today we'll hear from a remarkable team of researchers from across the department and PIH as they discuss the use of routine health systems data for a data-driven COVID-19 response in multiple locations. In order, we'll hear from Bethany Hegotier, Isabel Fulcher, Emma Jean Bowley, and Jean-Claude Mugunga. I'd like to give you a little background on each of them first. Bethany Hegotier is an Associate Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine at HMS and of Biostatistics at the Harvard Chan School, focusing on health systems research predominantly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Her primary research is on access to safe and affordable cesarean deliveries in Rwanda and equity in academic collaborations. Isabel Fulcher is a postdoctoral fellow with the Harvard Data Science Initiative and is particularly interested in developing causal inference methods to evaluate and improve the delivery of sexual and reproductive health care. Emma Jean Bali leads the Health Monitoring, Evaluation, and Medical Informatics Department with Partners in Health Liberia, working to improve health outcomes for marginalized populations in Liberia, particularly in its Maryland County. She's an epidemiologist with experience in surveillance of HIV and other infectious diseases and in the management of health data systems to inform clinical decisions and health policies. And Jean-Claude Mugunga is the Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Partners in Health, where he leads the organization's work related to population health planning, costing, and financing efforts towards universal health coverage. He's a lecturer in global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and the University of Global Health Equity. After they've spoken, we'll have time for Q&A, and we've allotted 90 minutes for the overall program, so please submit your questions at any point during the presentation through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to them at the end. But first, we've asked our department chair, Paul Farmer, Nicole Catroni's university professor at Harvard, to further, further frame the efforts of his esteemed colleagues. So Paul, I'll hand this over to you now. Thank you very much. And uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to, to be here with all of you. Um, and I apologize for having to leave a, a bit before this is over. Uh, I know that when you hear from Emma, Izzy, uh, Bethany, and, and Jean-Claude, you will learn something as I always do. I have to say, and going over the slides earlier, I, I ran into the term parametric bootstrap. Um, which I had never heard before. I understand that it'd be familiar to more our uh, quant colleagues. Um, but uh, I'm told that it signals uh, something that we see often in this collaborative work that is focused both on uh, understanding a problem and, on, and in responding to it. And uh, as Bethany and others said, uh, when we don't have a method, Sometimes we have to make up new ones and test them. So you'll hear more about that. Um, this presentation, which I've already had the chance to review, is uh, uh, a classic example of something that a team like this is well suited to address. What are the dimensions of a problem, even a rapidly uh, emerging one or a novel one? And of course, COVID is both of those things uh, in Liberia and elsewhere. But also, and again, this is what I think is rare, uh, how do you link this research to such pragmatic concerns um, uh, as avoiding uh, stockouts of everything from PPE to diagnostic to therapeutics, diagnostics to therapeutics. Um, and that can't be done, of course, without uh, quantitative and qualitative methods and without proximity to the problems uh, that are being addressed uh, in every sense. So I think you're going to uh, learn a lot and uh, it, it will be a spirited discussion, I'm sure. And when th this uh, approach of linking varied methods and sometimes new ones uh, in order to understand a specific problem is linked as it is in social medicine to a broader understanding of history and of political economy to uh, attempts to understand social history uh, and also to use social anthropology and other social sciences to help uh, deepen our understanding, the results can be not only pragmatic 
and effective and prompt, but also uh, instructive to people who are not working on that problem. And that is what I think we're going to hear today. Uh, I would add just in passing this over to Bethany, that these are the sort of methods and approaches that uh, fueled the, the dream of uh, linking social medicine to global health equity. And indeed is the reason that we pressed to change the name of the department uh, about 10 years ago from the Department of Social Medicine to Global Health and Social Medicine. Uh, and again, as is often the case when Bethany is involved, this is a dream that has been realized. Bethany, of course, needs no further introduction here. Um, and I would just like to add that in addition to pioneering a number of these approaches uh, in Rwanda, she has also and assiduously linked her work to questions about equity in the research itself. Who gets to learn these methods? Who gets to develop them? Who gets to design uh, research inquiry? Who gets to publish and share them? Who gets to make sure that they are used effectively? Uh, and in that arena, uh, Bethany has no peer. Um, Bethany, thank you very much. And I turn it over to you and your team. Thank you, Paul, for that kind introduction and to you and Scott and, and Carol for finding time for us to present this work. Um, really, our goal for today is to highlight some of the activities that we've been doing. Um, these are works in progress, and so we hope that by presenting this to a broader community that we can get some feedback. Um, but we also hope that some of the work that we've done can be seeded in other places to help um, other countries and programs have the information they need for COVID-19 response. So with that in mind, um, our outline for today, I have um, the task of, um, Izzy, do you mind advancing? Sorry. Um, I have the, the task of giving an overview of decades of partnership and probably thousands of hours of collaboration that have gone into this work in just a few slides. And from there, um, Izzy will dive into the methods and resources that we've developed for this work specifically. Emma will give some examples of syndromic surveillance in Liberia. And then finally, JC will lead us through a comparison of health service utilization across our sites using this approach. I want to start by describing the Global Health Delivery Partnership, which will be familiar to some but new to others. Um, this is a three sister entity that includes at the heart Partners in Health, which is a non governmental um, organization that's focused on equity and access to healthcare around the world, partnering with ministries of health in various locations. I sit in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School and am a member of the Global Health Research Corps. And this is the um, part of the partnership that really focuses on research and trying to understand the challenges that countries might face and also evaluate and distill best practices of um, programs that we hope other countries would adopt. And then finally, the third entity is the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital um, that provides a lot of the clinical expertise across the three arms, uh, across the partnership. When we talk about our cross-site collaboration, I, what we're really talking about are countries that are supported by Partners in Health as indicated here on the map. There are a few other countries where we have sister organizations and some of them are included in this work and we'll highlight some examples um, as we go along of these countries. Ahead of today and ahead of forming this group, um, you know, I, we've been thinking about what are the challenges that low and middle income countries are facing um, with the COVID-19 pandemic. And as I was brainstorming the slide, one of the things I want to highlight is these are really challenges that we're facing around the world. Um, they're not necessarily specific to the countries that we're supporting. So certainly a challenge that we're all facing is the limited to no information on the epidemiology of the novel coronavirus and the population effects. Um, you know, in March, we had very little understanding of who was at risk, what were the relevant um, respective morbidities and mortalities. We have more information now, but that's constantly changing and it makes it really challenging when you're trying to understand 
how much PPE you need to order, um, who do we need to isolate and who can be more fluid in the community. And so that has certainly been a big challenge. Another challenge around the world is the access to limited data to inform the response. This is perhaps one that's more acutely felt in the countries that we support. There's issues around the routine and data, harmonized data systems that we might have available to do some of this work. And we'll talk more about the routine systems that we have access to um, for this particular project. And then testing capacity, test access to high quality tests has been a challenge globally. Our countries that we support may have um, a, a bigger challenge with testing capacity in part because the testing infrastructure in February may have been more limited compared to what we might have access to in Boston, but also in the clamoring to get access to, to testing resources. A lot of countries that we support and other low and middle income countries have simply been elbowed out. And that is a big part of the advocacy of Partners in Health is trying to make sure that the testing resources that become available globally are available to the countries where we work and to other countries more broadly. And then finally, a challenge that many countries are facing are um, the secondary effects of containment and treatment programs. What are the effects of requiring isolation or distancing in the community? What are the effects of shutting down schools? What does it mean to change a surgical theater into an ICU? And so these are challenges that our countries are facing in addition to places around the world. To try and help the sites um, respond to these challenges and have the information that they need to adequately um, mount a COVID-19 response in the face of these challenges. John Claude, who you'll hear from in a bit, and Megan Murray, who is a professor at Harvard Medical School and the director of research from part for Partners in Health, established a cross-site, cross-PH site collaboration. This is a group that includes colleagues from each of the countries that Partners in Health supports, along with some centralized um, team members from Harvard Medical School and the, the Division of Global Health Equity. We meet weekly with the goal of identifying the core and common questions that all the sites face. And then once we have those questions to develop rigorous methods that are contextually appropriate to answer these questions. And then finally, we're working collaboratively to implement and share the lessons learned across sites as um, these methods are being deployed. The questions that were identified early on that really has become the focus of all of our work the first is what is the burden of COVID-19 specifically in the communities and countries that we support? This is really important to understand the risk, but also important for, as Paul mentioned, being able to adequately prepare and respond to the epidemic and pandemic in different contexts. A second common question is how is COVID-19 directly affecting health? And this is um, for our sites, particularly with a focus on high-risk groups where there might be limited information otherwise. So for example, a lot of our programs support multi-drug resistant tuberculosis patients. Um, and so how do we, um, how are those patients more or differentially at risk or how is their morbidity different compared to the general population? These are the types of questions that we're trying to answer across our sites. And then finally, how is the COVID-19 pandemic affecting care and outcomes across the health system, not just the direct care that patients who are infected with coronavirus experience, but also the care of other patients in other parts of our healthcare system. I want to emphasize that a lot of the work um, that's happening in, in, these, in this group and in these countries are being led by the countries themselves. So this is just an example of a health policy brief that just came out of Partners in Health Mexico. It was led by the team in Mexico really highlighting their response um, in, in country. And so this is something that's being led by Mexico, but we do distill this um, disseminate this within our group and discuss it within our group, both so that we can learn from the Mexico experience, but also so that we can encourage other sites to replicate these types of studies as appropriate for, um, for their particular uh, country in question. But there are a series of cross-country collaborate, collaborative work that we've undertaken. Um, the first two, I'm gonna give a bit of a teaser here just to, um, 
give you a sense of what we've been working on, but also to point you in the direction of a few different resources that we've developed. And then the heart of this presentation is going to be focusing on the third cross country collaborative work um, using routine health system information for syndromic surveillance and health service utilization. The cross-site serosurveillance work, the goal of serosurveillance is to estimate the prevalence of COVID-19 antibodies in a particular population with the goal of understanding how much virus has previously circulated in this population and to get a sense of how vulnerable that population might be to new exposures in that community. Um, an example of some of this zero surveillance work is Partners in Health Haiti has been doing activities to estimate the prevalence of COVID-19 antibodies in healthcare workers that have been exposed through, um, through providing care to patients who are infected with coronavirus in their various sites. Some of the cross-site work that we've been doing for this, um, one is as countries decide that they want to undertake a serious surveillance activity, we help the sites develop protocols and implement those protocols. And then we analyze the data that come from these CRO surveys using the appropriate methods to account for imperfect tests. A second example of some support activities is developing these protocols and having discussions um, across our sites about appropriate ways to implement the CRO surveys. One question that we discussed quite a bit was whether or not individuals who participate in these serious surveys should receive the results of their antibody test. And we had extensive discussions of the pros and cons of returning test results and also other considerations that um, should be taken into account as you make these decisions at each site. And we have a preprint of these considerations forthcoming that hopefully will help other countries as they're um, wrestling with this decision about returning individual results. And then finally, as Paul mentioned, we've had to do some methods development. So one of the approaches that Partners in Health Haiti was exploring for um, serious surveillance and healthcare workers was using an approach called lock quality assurance sampling, which would effectively classify health centers as having either high antibody prevalence or low antibody prevalence. The challenge of this approach was um, the tests that we're using for COVID antibodies are not perfect tests and the method that they wanted to use wasn't able to account for imperfect tests. And so we've done methods extensions to be able to account for imperfect tests and you can find that work in a preprint on med archives if you're interested to learn more. A second cross-site activity is implementing cohort studies. This has been work led by Dale Barnhart and she's developed a series of study designs, but also specific survey instruments that have been incredibly valuable for sites, but would also be a resource for those of you listening in that you think you might wanna implement some of these cohort studies. So if you're interested in learning more about cohort studies, Dale is scheduled to present more of that work in the spring, but you can always reach out to Dale if you want to have access to some of those resources that she's cultivated for this work. So for the cohort studies, we're talking about following particular groups of patients with the goal, uh, groups of individuals with the goal of understanding, um, one, the epidemiology and progression of disease, both overall and in specific high-risk groups. And then two, to understand how um, care has changed or how outcomes have changed for patients who are in chronic care programs at our sites. Um, for these cohort studies, Dale has developed five different study designs that we present as a menu of cohort options and countries can pick and choose from this menu the designs that most align with their priorities and best integrate within the activities that they're already doing at their sites. And then once they pick a particular design, they can decide what disease areas are their priority disease areas that they would apply that design to. And again, I want to just encourage you if you're interested in implementing some cohort studies that Dale has both details of these designs and of the survey instruments available um, for others to use. So to that end, um, and before I hand this over to dive into um, this particular cross-site activity, I wanna emphasize that our goal first and foremost was to provide um, the, the data and resources that the countries that we support to be able to, to have the most data-informed COVID-19 response. 
And in that process, we've developed a lot of new methods, a lot of tools um, that we wanted to make sure were publicly available for others to replicate as it was appropriate for their needs. And so we have developed this um, website that houses a lot of the resources that we'll talk about today. At the end of the talk, there will be a URL that you'll be able to link to that website. Um, this is a temporary website. We will migrate over to a more permanent website in the next few weeks, but you'll be able to follow all of that development on, on the URL that's provided. Um, so if you see a particular method that you're interested to learn more about, if you see a particular um, analysis that you want to be able to replicate. There's most likely a paper or code that was publicly available for you to use. Probably the most important feature on that website is the contact us button. So if you want access to any of these resources, please just email us via that website and we're happy to share any of the information that we have um, available to you. And with this website, I just want to acknowledge a group of students um, that have um, students from across the country that have volunteer, volunteered their time and talents to help us develop a lot of this technical content. And so um, as you see some of the pieces that we have been sharing with the sites and that we're sharing more publicly, and even the website itself, I just want to acknowledge that they have been volunteering a lot of time to help us get this off the ground. So I look forward to the rest of the presentation. I look forward to everyone's feedback and um, Thank you. Over to you, Izzy. Thank you, Bethany. In my portion of this presentation, I'll be focusing on that third activity that uh, Bethany mentioned. Specifically, I'll focus on the methods our team have, have used to leverage routine health systems data to improve COVID-19 uh, response in the countries that we're working with. So there are really two goals of this activity. And the first goal is to assess that direct impact of COVID-19 uh, by using syndromic surveillance. So this will involve using data on symptoms or outcomes directly related to COVID-19 to flag um, geographic areas for potential COVID-19 circulation. So this does not use information on positive COVID-19 tests, but instead, instead uses information on symptoms such as pneumonia, cough and colds um, to identify potential hotspots at the health facility level. And so this will be really useful in countries or settings when, where there isn't a robust testing system. And the second goal is to quantify the indirect impacts of COVID-19 on utilization of essential health services, uh, which can range from just assessing the changes in the number of outpatient visits um, at a facility to the number of babies that are delivered in a health facility to the number of children receiving their immunizations. Um, and despite these two goals being distinct, they do share uh, the fact that they will both use routinely collected data and also look for deviations from what is expected based on prior data. So the data science tools that we will propose today will be similar for both of these activities, even though they're both achieving different goals. So I've now said routine data collection a few times, um, and I just want to highlight that this looks different in different countries and also within countries. So all the countries that we'll be talking about today have their own routine data collection system, which means that data on some health indicators are collected on a regular basis. Um, so countries can differ in the availability of those indicators. Some countries might have information on pneumonia or cough and colds, whereas other countries may not. Um, in addition, the mode of collection can differ greatly between and within countries. So is the data being collected electronically, or is it uh, paper-based? And so that will also impact the frequency of reporting. So if it's electronically correct collected, maybe that's instantaneous. Um, so someone could immediately see what has been um, collected. Whereas if the mode of collection is paper-based, it might be, we, we might only see the reports come out on a weekly or monthly basis. Um, also, is the data at the individual level or is it aggregated at a facility level? So are we saying that there was a pneumonia case on September 15th at 9 a.m. or are we saying there were 37 pneumonia cases in the month of September? Um, and of course, there's going to be differences in what the data actually looks like in its raw format, um, in addition to just data quality checks that go on um, at the facility levels, in addition to um, what happens when it reaches the monitoring and evaluation officials. So during the talk today, we're just going to focus on aggregated monthly health um, 
uh, aggregated monthly data that's collected at the health facility. And Emma is going to talk about what that looks like in uh, Liberia for the DHIS2 um, system in, in, in the next part of this presentation. So we started this effort in March um, with multiple sites through, through PIH. And what we first did is we sat down with the sites to establish their goals in using their routine data. So first, we assessed if syndromic surveillance would be of use. And in most, in six of the seven countries, um, we realized that it was probably useful to collect information on symptoms and outcomes directly related to COVID-19 because there was a lack of robust testing system and this could provide further information on potential hotspots in those countries. In addition, all sites um, were interested in doing some um, analysis with health service utilization to assess just these indirect effects of COVID-19 on different indicators. I should note that these indicator, the indicators that were available and of interest in different countries varied, as well as the number of health facilities that we were collecting information from. So sites had anywhere from um, 10 to 900 facilities that they were, um, had data available from and had anywhere from 10 to 50 indicators of interest. So we were really uh, working with a lot of data and we wanted to set up a, a streamlined process for dealing with it. So the first step was to collect um, all of the baseline data back to 2016 so that we could establish a baseline and then set up a way to just rapidly clean that. Um, so that it was able, it, when I say clean, that means that it's ready for analysis. Um, and then as each month, um, each month during the COVID-19 pandemic, we would clean the data from that month and run um, our analysis. And then we would have this constant feedback loop with sites to interpret and discuss results and then get new data on the next month. And just, we're still cycling through that process now. And I, I wanna just quickly touch on what this automated data processing pipeline looks like for both cleaning data as well as running the analysis and then outputting um, data visualizations for the sites to use. So, as I mentioned, we receive this raw data from the, the sites on a monthly basis. We have an automated way to clean that data, um, do a quick data quality check, and then run our different statistical analyses, which I'll talk about in the following slides. And from there, we create multiple um, data visualizations so that sites can uh, quickly identify any potential areas of hotspots or decreases in health service utilization indicators. Um, and where our output is a, is a PDF report that is easy to share with Ministry of Health officials or other um, key players, as well as an online tool that allows for different um, cuts of the data and really going into a deep dive of what's happening at some of the facility levels and across indicators. So now I'm gonna to touch on our, uh, the actual statistical methods that were used for both the syndromic surveillance and the health service utilization routine monitoring piece. And so we use time series modeling to identify deviations in um, specific indicators. So what I have on the left side of my screen here is uh, an indicator, uh, the indicator of acute respiratory infections, which was identified as a key indicator for syndromic surveillance in Liberia. And Emma will walk through those results later. So this is just an example. Uh, on the x-axis is the um, is time on a month. So this first dot here would be the number of acute respiratory infections that was observed in January 2016, and that goes all the way through 2020. So the baseline period was chosen to be uh, the pre-COVID era, which we defined as prior to January 2020. And we'll use that baseline, the data from this baseline period to create predicted baseline counts with 95% prediction intervals in the COVID era. And that's really what we're going to use to look for the deviations. So then um, using the data just from the baseline period, we fit a time series model to predict the number of acute respiratory infections during each month um, with that 95% prediction interval. So the red line here is that predicted value and then the light red is that interval. And so the model we use is um, a common model. It was also used by uh, the Dan Weinberger lab at Yale to identify deviations um, in New York City during the pandemic as well. Uh, so we basically have a term here that captures yearly trends. So as we can see here, it's trending down over time. And then we also have a term to capture seasonality uh, via these harmonic functions, which is, are these dips that you see on a yearly basis. Um, and so this, the model that was used was a negative binomial model um, to model these, the counts on a monthly basis. 
And so then the final step is layering on what was actually observed to look for um, deviations in the evaluation period, so during the COVID, COVID era. Um, and potential spikes in that might lead one to believe that there are hot spots or just warrant further investigation. And so one way to do this is just by visually looking at the graph and seeing if this is outside of the predicted range or looks larger than expected, or by quantifying a deviation measure, which is the observed minus the predicted counts divided by the predicted counts. And we just divide by the predicted counts um, to make it easy to compare across indicators as well as multiple, um, multiple facilities. So of course, there were a lot of potential complications um, that we met when tr trying to analyze this data. A big one was just that there was missing data in both the baseline and evaluation periods. Um, and so we developed that parametric bootstrap approach that, that Paul called out at the beginning of the talk uh, as a method for um, imputing those missing values. And that was developed um, uh, by a PhD student in the biostat department, Anurag. Um, as well, uh, you probably already thought of this question while I was going through this, is we needed to account for drops in health service utilization in syndromic surveillance. Um, so you could imagine that health service utilization just drops overall. So the number of total outpatient visits um, might decrease. And so to account for that, so that the acute number of acute respiratory infections might also be dropping. Um, to account for that, we also look at the proportion of total visits that are due to acute respiratory infection. So you'll see both counts, raw counts for the number of visits, as well as um, the proportion of visits. And lastly, of course, there's data quality issues. So we've been working with sites to identify um, those specific issues and um, just flag for them and try to adjust for them in different ways. You'll see three different data visualizations throughout this um, talk. So the first is the time series plot, which I've already showed. And this really captures all of the available information um, for each of the time points, as well as what the model is predicting. So it gives you the full transparent view of actually what the data looks like. Um, you could, this is, while this is a wealth of information, you can imagine that it might be very difficult to compare across 50 different indicators and 900 different facilities. So how do we kind of distill this in a way that's more easy to digest um, for sites? So the, so the, we'll also be showing a heat map, which just captures that deviation measure across multiple time points. So this is not giving the full granularity of what the data looks like, but it is kind of just giving a quick view of trends over time. It might be easier for comparison. And lastly, to get a sense of a spatial perspective, we also have developed maps. Um, and this is just gonna show you the deviations for a single time point, but we have made it interactive using this uh, R package called Leaflet so that sites can zoom in, look at specific facilities within counties or districts, as well as just looking at the raw and um, raw counts as well as the proportions. As I mentioned, we developed an interactive online tool for sites to use for decision-making. Um, this, we have made this available internally for PIH for countries to kind of share information um, and toggle between so they can see what, what's happening with other indicators at, in other countries. Um, as well, we, we allow for looking at counts and pro that proportioned measure that I discussed earlier, uh, toggling indicator as well as the, the facility that you're looking at. In addition, we've allowed for comparing across um, indicators as well as sites, it, and also included this interactive map that I mentioned earlier. So there's a few next steps for this methods work. Um, as I mentioned, that we're just kind of applying that, that model that I showed across all facilities and all, of, all indicators on this monthly basis. But of course, we could kind of fine tune those models for different health facilities or, or countries and incorporate things like um, stock out of different immunizations for health service utilization or just other intricacies that go on at the country or facility level. So that's kind of our next step for, for the modeling. In addition, um, we want to validate the syndromic surveillance with the serosurveillance work. So as Bethany mentioned, we are doing uh, conducting serosurveillance at some of these sites at the, at the health facility level. So it would be interesting to see if spikes in certain symptoms correlate with um, 
uh, estimated prevalence of antibodies in those facilities to really validate the use of syndromic surveillance. And, and lastly, um, we've, we're considering pooling, or sorry, considering using multiple data sources to predict hotspots. So we have information on syndromic surveillance, health service utilization, as well as the sero surveillance work, um, in addition to uh, Facebook mobility data that we could kind of use together to predict uh, potential hotspots. And I'm just going to end with some available resources. Um, as, as Bethany mentioned, we do have our the GitHub code available for both the data analysis and visualization, um, and the link for that is here. Um, we'll be posting a preprint of the, the methods paper that just describes everything I discussed in more detail, um, a preprint hopefully available in mid-October, as well as we are doing capacity building for the sites um, to conduct uh, these statistical methods as well as create those data visualizations um, in November. And so we'll post videos and all the material for, those, um, for that short course, uh, make it publicly available. So I'm now gonna hand it over to Emma to talk about how these methods were applied um, in Liberia. Thank you. Emma, you're muted. Okay, I'm on now. Hi everyone, I'm gonna talk about some of the uh, surveillance, uh, syndromic surveillance work uh, from PIH Liberia. But first I'm gonna highlight um, the countries. Uh, health systems, health information systems, as well as uh, current updates on COVID-19, and then we'll get into some discussions about the results. So for background information, Liberia is located on the west coast of Africa. The country has a population of roughly about 5.1 million people, which is roughly um, the same population size as the state of Alabama. The country already also has 15 counties, uh, 62% of its population are under the age of 25 years old. Most Liberians lived in Moravia, which is the capital city, with a roughly about 20% of its population. Other cities like areas like Hopper, where Maryland, uh, in Maryland County, where PIH has a supported facility, there's roughly an uh, estimated population of less than 50,000 people. There are, in totality, there are 922 health facilities across the 15 counties in Liberia. 99% reports in the GHIS2. Of those health facilities, 59% are governmental owned, 5% are mission fit based institutions, 34% uh, are private organizations, and 2% are non government NGOs. Maryland has a total health uh, system, health facility of 26. Uh, health facility across the county, 20, I'm sorry, 96% reports into GHIS2. Of those health facilities, 92% are governmental owned and 8% are private institutions. Maryland also has a total of six health districts across the county. Partisan Health provides support in five of those health uh, districts. The largest being Plebo with roughly about 56,000 people. Maryland itself has a population of 175,000 people, roughly. So this map, this process map shows the workflow of health information from the community level and health facilities into DHIS2, which is the, count, the country's major data repository. So between the first and the fifth of every month, Community health assistants and community health volunteers collect community-based health data from the various catchment areas, and that is turned over to the local health facility. At the local health facility, aggregated health information from patient cards and ledgers are then put onto a standardized HMIS form, and that too is done between the first and the fifth of every month. That standardized form with the aggregated data is then turned over to the officers in charge at each of those health facilities by the fifth of every month. The officers in charge, they are responsible for them certifying the results. And then that is turned over to the district health team. In Maryland County, the county health uh, department, particularly its m &E department, is responsible between the fifth and the 15th of every month 
to collect all of the standardized HMIS form and then enter that into GHIS2. That has to be done by the 17th of every month. So this uh, dashboard shows current updates of COVID-19 in Liberia. As of September 28, 2020, Liberia has recorded 1,343 COVID cases. 82 has resulted in deaths. Uh, 1,221 cases have led to recoveries. And currently there's 40 confirmed cases, active cases in the country. The map highlights uh, the current COVID-19 status across the various counties. So the counties in red currently have an active case. The counties in yellow, they have a suspected case and individuals with suspected COVID-19 are currently undergoing an 18 day quarantine uh, period. 14 days for self quarantine and then another four days to get back test results. The country, the counties in the uh, green have no active or suspected cases, but they do have mechanisms in place to be able to address COVID. Thus far, the case fatality rates in Liberia is about 6% of the confirmed cases in Liberia. 35% have been observed in women, 65% have been observed in men. Maryland has recorded 32 confirmed cases, which is roughly about 2.4% of the total confirmed cases in Liberia. So this first map, heat map, shows the deviation in proportion of ARI cases in Liberia during the evaluation period. So that is from January 2020 until July 2020. And as we can see here, for the first three months, counties such as Sino, Riverside, Maserato, Maryland, and even Grand Cru and Grand Chita, most of the counties had a deviation higher than what we expected for the first three months. And then on March 15, 2020, Liberia recorded her first COVID-19 case. Subsequently, on the 22nd of March, there was a national health emergency declared after the third confirmed case. Partners in Health Liberia work with our partners both at the Central Ministry of Health and also at the county level to be able to implement containment measures. These measures included screening at all COVID, screening at all entry points in Maryland County, screening at all PIA supported facilities, the implementation of social distancing protocols, and also testing, contact tracing, and quarantine. And after those uh, implementation measures were implemented, Maryland County recorded a deviation in proportion that was lower than what we expected as compared to her surrounding counties, Sino, Riverside, Grand Cru, and Grand Chita. Next, we looked at the proportion of ARR cases in at four PIA supported facilities in Maryland County for all age groups. These four counties where these four facilities are J.J. Dawson, E.F. Wallace, St. Francis, and Plebo Health Center. And we can see here, late 2019 into early 2020, we observed a higher proportion of ARI cases at J.J. Dawson, E.F. Health, E.F. Wallace, St. Francis. However, at Plebo Health Center, where PIH provides most of her support, we observed the quite opposite, which was a reduction in the proportion of ARI cases for all age groups. Next, we looked at the proportion of ARI cases at these same facilities, but only in individuals five or older. And again, at JJ Dawson, Edith Wallace, and St. Francis, we observed a proportion of ARI cases starting late 2019 into early 2020, we observed a proportion that was higher at these three health facilities as compared to Plebo Health Center, where the ARI counts, the proportion of ARI was lower at Plebo Health Center than what we expected for individuals five or older. 
Next, we looked at the same four health facilities, but individuals less than five years old. We looked at the proportion of ARI counts. And we observed a similar trend in that JJ Dawson, Edith Wallace, St. Francis all had a, deep, a proportion that was higher than what we expected at these three health facilities. But at Plebo Health Center, we observed a proportion of ARI counts lower than what we expected for individuals five or younger. Lastly, we looked at the deviation in proportion of ARI cases across the entire country, looking specifically at different counties. And here, the red highlights the deviation in proportion that was higher than what we expected. The blue highlights the deviation in proportion lower than what we expected. And the white shows no deviation at all. And four months after the containment measures were implemented in July 2020, Maryland has maintained a deviation lower than what we expected in Maryland County as compared to her surrounding counties, which are Grand Cru, Grand Gita, and uh, Rewa South and Sino counties. So these results have been very informative in helping address COVID-19 in, in Liberia. A couple of ways we've used these results We've shared them at the Central Ministry of Health with our partners and also in Maryland County with CHT and also internally with our clinicians to be able to help detect potential COVID-19 hotspots in catchment areas within Maryland County and also throughout Liberia in other counties. We've used this result to inform the surveillance measures such as strategic testing, We've also used it to inform the need for staffing increases and also other supply chains needs such as adequate PPE and also having other protective gears. There are two major discussion points with these results. The first one is potential reporting biases. So as patients became more aware and informed about COVID-19, they may have underreported ARI symptoms or chosen not to go to health facilities based on fear of being quarantined. Clinicians may have also not identified COVID-19 symptoms as ARI because of concern that it may have triggered a COVID-19 investigation. Also, the impact of COVID-19 on the overall data systems in Liberia. For example, in the beginning of the pandemic, at the national level, CHWs were told to stop household visits until they had received proper training on COVID-19 response and also adequate PPE supplies. And this may have led to decreased reporting at the community level. Also, the overall timeliness and completeness of reporting at the facility level may have decreased, especially early on during COVID-19. To address these concerns, in Maryland County, my department works primarily with the uh, district health team and county health teams to be able to provide support around routine data collection and entry into DHIS2. And as you can see, Maryland County, of the facilities that are reporting to Maryland County, that effort has led to complete in timeliness and completeness of data collection and entry into DHIS2 in Maryland County. And so a couple of ways these results have been really useful to us in Liberia, it has led to us to help us in informing decisions around strategic planning, around testing, community awareness, and other preventative measures. It's also helped us routinely address, you know, trends around COVID-19 across not only Maryland County, but other counties in Liberia to inform decisions around potential containment measures uh, and other policies to address COVID-19. And lastly, these results, particularly looking at the trend of ARI cases 
over time could help us further evaluate COVID-19 impact on other health conditions, such as asthma and other related health conditions. And so I will now turn it over to my colleague, JC, to talk about uh, health utilization services across multiple sites. Uh, thank you, Emma. And thank you, Bethany uh, Izzy, uh, for the previous part. Uh, I'm happy to talk about this uh, other side of the coin. Uh, we're talking about how do we observe when COVID-19 symptoms are going up. But also now this is the part where we said let's start tracking the non-COVID essential services that we know are going to be impacted by COVID-19 pandemic using the similar method that are being used to predict the illness syndromic surveillance we presented. We applied on those indicators around the key services. So we cannot really ignore uh, the broader needs of the health uh, uh, that people need just uh, during this emergency. So these predictive results that we are going to show you uh, come from selected countries, but we are doing most of these in all, almost all of the sites involved in this research uh, network, as well as uh, using routine data to see what's happening with other services. Uh, on the next slide, we are looking at the results from uh, Mitsutu, Liberia, and Malawi, where PIH is supporting health facilities that are really our colleagues who work with uh, giving us this data and trying to keep up in the completeness. Uh, but this is actually the best timing where we have to focus on data completeness as well as uh, data uh, accuracy in order to really be able to tell the story of what's going on. As you might expect uh, in uh, the dotted line here that corresponded to 2020 is uh, the COVID era and the period before that it's pre-COVID era. And the shaded in the purple area is um, where the visits are within 95 confidence intervals should be falling. If they go uh, way beyond that purple area, that means something is going up, but they are dipping below or they are going higher. Um, so the line that we are looking at the observed data, uh, observed visits, observed services provided is this black line. Uh, in Lesotho and uh, Liberia, you see that uh, in the COVID era, there is a dip uh, that's really swinging all the way down. Um, interestingly, for the case of Malawi, uh, things keep swinging up and down, but you don't see a remarked uh, way below the purple shaded area of the expected. So we want to zoom in a little bit. That's why in our methods, we try to zoom in a little bit. If need be, look at the individual facilities, as well as speaking to our, our country colleagues, uh, colleagues who are on the ground, to be able to tell the story of what these models are telling us. So in the case of Lesotho, they actually where we support seven rural facilities in addition to the other districts that PIH has supported the reform of healthcare. Uh, it's a country where the border of South Africa is all around and the country, uh, the economic uh, activities of the population really is tied to South Africa. On March 29th, uh, there was um, a lockdown. So this country experienced the lockdown and the border clo closing um, around March and April which will lead to some of these uh, restricted movement of people, including patients seeking care. There was also some intentional adjustment of supply side of services, where some of the patients were vacated from uh, Berea Hospital, uh, that most of our facilities um, um, transfer patients to, uh, as well as uh, creating a national COVID center. There was also reduced patient load, uh, just trying to dispense medication and make patients stay away from facilities for nosocomial infection and being uh, possibility of being infected at the facilities, giving them like six month supply for stable HIV patients. So some of these observed dips might, might be explained by some of these stories. In uh, Liberia, um, you also saw a dip but when you look at the part of the story, it also correlates to the lockdown. Uh, they confirmed the first case on March 16th, and then the strict lockdown measures started to, to continue. 
and that affected the traffic uh, that we receive at uh, most of um, the facilities. Even after the selective lockdowns started in May, there is also that is going to continue to affect as we interpret the dips. We also have to take into account are we part of the selective lockdown areas? Um, so we also work towards in a county that's very near the Ivory Coast, as Emma was showing, some patients coming from the Ivory Coast, that could be part of the story that might not be coming as much during that era we are looking at. Uh, in the case of Malawi, the story will say they didn't really have so much strict lockdown. We, we support uh, facilities that are located in Neno district uh, of Malawi. Um, but when you look at the story of what happened in the country in general, the hotspot continued to be in Lilongwe. And when the lockdown was imposed, there was actually some, uh, if, if a, a national judge who tried to um, overturn that lockdown. And then in the case of Neno, we didn't see a lot of lockdowns being observed. And uh, part of that, our services also tried to focus on uh, making sure the community health workers are empowered to do no touch, but continues to encourage some of these visits to happen. So outside of the patients, we look at, at some other indicators like immunization, where if you are dealing with a pandemic uh, like COVID-19 and then immunization as important as they are, if you miss up on that, you mess up on that, it also causes to other damages, especially in areas, for example, if they still had polio, it's, uh, it's one of those you have to watch closely and make sure you stay consistent and you keep up with those services. Uh, Lesotho, Liberia, um, and uh, Malawi, part of the studies we're looking at, there is a dip you can see in Liberia, obviously, um, and uh, Malawi, uh, we don't see much uh, on this view unless we dip into it and see how many facilities uh, got some of the dips. And then in Lesotho, we are not seeing any um, dip as much around this. But let's zoom in, for example, on the next slide, um, immunization in Liberia, where it's obvious, even on the bigger picture of the previous slide, we see a dip. Uh, we are taking a look at four facilities that are reported in here and supported uh, directly by Partners in Health. Uh, it's consistent. JJ Dawson at the hospital, uh, Edith Wallace Center, um, as well as People Health Center, they all had immunization below what would be expected. Um, so part of this, uh, we can say, is uh, is 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 linked to the lockdowns, similar to the outpatients. Uh, but then that all of the interventions that try to bring this up have to look at now if the lockdowns are lifted, for example, are we encouraging uh, community health workers or patients and kids to be immunized? Uh, uh, in general, let's look at this other service utilization story, including um, vaccinations, uh, outpatients, if we look at this uh, as a whole, there are things we can learn between the country and the country, things that we can learn uh, on the demand side as well as on the supply side, and uh, what consequences some of these long term have in the long term. Country to country, that's where we look at the stories, which country had lockdowns, how strict were they, to what extent, how was um, uh, the system of healthcare adapted, uh, did, they, did they adapt to that lockdowns um, in terms of reaching the facility uh, patients in the community outreaches. And then when you look at the supply side, some of these vaccination centers or health facilities were repurposed or uh, changed the traffic in order to uh, con uh, contain the pandemic during those uh, first months. And the demand side, as you can imagine, there's some fear when you start to hear about a pandemic, especially in countries like um, Sierra Leone and Liberia that we are working in after having gone through Ebola. So this will bring concerns about healthcare seeking behavior once that starts in a community. So the demand side also changes uh, around that. So trying to understand what happens there, talk to people and see what helps them to keep up with services. 
And then there's some population mobility, obviously, and the geography that you have to take into account as you interpret this into the story. Um, in Malawi, we have some of this, uh, the, the centers that are near uh, high mobility centers like Zalewa uh, on the road to Mozambique. Uh, and then as we conclude in this story, we want to look at does any of these um, have long-term consequences that will change service utilizations? And how can we start to talk now in order to maintain health services moving forward? how to fix this or how to meet our patients halfway. Uh, overall summary uh, of this collaboration really and what I was presented in the previous slide is that we want to continue a design and a partnership and a methodology, a very thoughtful research that goes in to solve some of these issues in the COVID era but that can continue even when COVID is, is finished and we continue this collaboration. Megan, um, Bethany, the teams and uh, the team of students as well as other universities we've, we've, we've been working with, everyone is committed and uh, we look forward to continue to engage more staff in our sites, not just those very closely to the data in order to continue this. And when this started, actually, this is another part of the story. We didn't go in saying this is a research activity. It was more like, how can we support? The, uh, the testing, as you all know, it's still very not widespread. So syndromic surveillance as a tool that comes to say, OK, well, we don't have a way to test it very quickly, massively. And how can we record the good data and be able to predict where things are going higher or lower than expected? Uh, so materials that are coming from here can solve maybe some answer and solve some of the care coordination and the care provision in the future for other people who might need it. So we are willing to really share some of these. They will be posted publicly and we encourage uh, most of our site and colleagues to continue really doing the good job they are doing and uh, especially ensuring the data completeness. I want to acknowledge some of the, most of the people we actually work with in a lot of sites, as well as institutions that are outside of PIH and the Global Health Partnerships. Um, so we spoke, the four of us, but we are presenting a big team from sites from Rwanda, Haiti, Malawi, all of these people involved in this work that we're speaking on behalf of. And uh, in the case specifically of syndromic surveillance and ensuring that we count the essential services, we are partnering with uh, the University of British Columbia, Professor Mike Wall, uh, Karen in, at the University of Hong Kong, and others who are involved in this project. It's really a good partnership that continues to deliver. So we hope our sites and the colleagues will continue to, 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 to support this and uh, build on it moving forward. Thank you, everybody, and this is our presentation. Well, thank you so much. I want to thank Bethany and Izzy and Emma and Jean-Claude for a fascinating talk, which raises issues of scale, relationship between data acquisition and, and utilization of that data. So thank you all so much. Um, and so we encourage you all to submit questions and answers. We have a couple excellent questions already. But first, I wanted to give the chance for, for Megan Murray to see if she has to take a first shot at any questions you may have or thoughts you may have. Uh, Dr. Murray is the Rhonda Stryker and William Johnson Professor of Global Health HMS and professor at the Chan School of Public Health as well, and certainly a mentor to, I think, everyone here and certainly to, to, to many of us. So, Megan, if you have any thoughts, I'd like to give you a chance to go first. Uh, I, I just want to say that this has been a, a really um, noble effort on a lot of people's part. Uh, the the Jean-Claude uh, um, has led a PIH-based uh, research team, and, you know, in the past, while we've done lots of research work with the various sites, we've actually never um, been able to, to pull all these sites together to do this kind of um, joint analysis. And it's not easy. There's a lot of different things going on, and particularly in this kind of period. But um, and what it has taken, I think, is real commitment on the part of people at the sites and the team in Boston um, to, to stick with the the sort of laborious task of communicating well. And that really underlies, I think, most of the success of this work. 
uh, it's, it's really important. Um, we have, you know, you've certainly seen how complex getting uh, and estimates of incidence of COVID, even in the U.S., where we have excellent uh, access to, to diagnostic tools. Um, well, <laughs> some <laughs> might argue with that, <laughs> but we should have access, uh, excellent access to diagnostic tools, certainly compared to many of the countries we work in. And so people had to be really creative about thinking about how can we learn something from the data that we have, and then how can we make use of tools as they become available and how can we coordinate? But it's just, it's been, um, it's been a really encouraging uh, uh, effort. And I've learned a ton from watching how Bethany and her team have interacted uh, and with the sites and how the sites, you know, have been able to be engaged in research without a, a lot of statistical background. And, and really one of our major goals is to develop that research capacity that will uh, allow a, a, a kind of a more equal partnership. And I think that that, that's, that goal has really been advanced with this work. So I'm, I'm really proud to be involved in it. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of our team. Uh, um, anyway, congratulations, guys. Very well, thank, thank you, you. Megan. Uh, here's a question. I, I suspect this is directed towards either Emma or Jean-Claude, but everyone may have input on it. The question is, Awesome talk, and thank you for the lessons on uh, the lens on COVID-19. Can I ask generically, in terms of translation of actionable insights into particular policy intervention and scale considerations, what is usually the anticipated turnover like for mobilizing national effort? If in the event that there is anticipated lag, I'm curious about the challenges that might contribute to this that perhaps might be consistent across these different localities as well. And I think Emma had started to address some of these, how this gets translated from the data that you're acquiring to communicating to Ministries of Health or others to actually create actionable items from that. So I, I guess the question is, um, what are the challenges to that? Emma, please, please go ahead. Sure. I think that some of the meetings we've had with the Ministry of Health, I think once the data is available, the challenge is actually getting the test tools and all of the necessary uh, equipment, PPE, to be able to implement it. And as we have said, that even in the U.S., testing has been a challenge, and it is um, uh, uh, um, too in Liberia. And we were able to uh, donate about 10,000 test kits to uh, the uh, Ministry of Health in Liberia, and I was able to help uh, at least facilitate the testing initiatives there. But again, due to the challenges in logistics and supply chains, you know, the, the data helps, you know, with the planning, but the, the other aspects is actually getting the resources needed to do the, the, the testing and all of the other equipments needed to, and plus Liberia, uh, geographically, now it's rainy season, and so it's really challenging moving around from one county to another too. And so, uh, even though we 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 um, we engage Ministry of Health and we tell them, you know, uh, here are some of the data we see, and here are the strategic tools we can address it. We are still having enormous challenges with getting supplies to uh, them so that they can be able be able to implement some of the uh, uh, testing capacity and needs. Sean Claude, did you want to add to that at all? No, I think she covered most of it. Um, yeah, so I would say in terms of communicating with the ministries, uh, we work very closely with the ministries. Um, each time these uh, results are showing something that's not going well. Is mentioned that we are now sharing these uh, dashboards and reports uh, with our sites. Um, where it hasn't been very consistent, it's because the methods were still being built. So we hope we'll continue to be sharing this and whatever there is something suspected and critical, we are not providing services, our patients are not showing up. Uh, in action that involves both uh, the ministry and uh, partners, that, including us, is, is employed in terms of community outreach. How can we now reach patients if they are not coming in for services? So that communication is ensured and will continue as we read from these dashboards. Yeah, I'd love to add to that, um, just because there was a question that embedded there around the lag. Um, so one of the processes that have been put in place is that 
from the time that the data is available in the DHIS2 system to the time that um, the teams are having calls, country specific calls to interpret the data is about 10 days. So there is a lag, but I think for folks who've worked with DHIS2 data before, a 10 day lag is actually just incredibly quick for this type of data. Um, but the goal is on those country specific calls, it's generally led by um, Izzy, from the technical side, Izzy and one or two of the student interns along with the team leads from the country. And they'll sit down and go indicator by indicator and talk about what they're seeing, what's jumping out as concerning, where there might be data quality issues, and they have this deep dive. But then really at that point, the data is turned over to the teams to use it as appropriate within their own networks. So we are, there's not a prescription, and I suspect it's probably different for every country, for is it used locally within health centers? Is it used nationally at the Ministry of Health level? Um, and I think that really depends on the relationships of each site with their various programs. Um, but one of the unique aspects of this is we try to make the lag as short as possible, and we try to empower the sites to have the resources they need to facilitate those conversations. Great. There's a second question that also starts off, this is great. And this, this, this came out right before um, Emma's portion of the talk, so she may have answered this to some degree, but Will there be attempts to incorporate community-based routine data sources? Some counties, some countries, for example, Rwanda, have routine community reports of some of these indicators. Health facility level data alone may miss spread in the community. Also, community would allow more precise geographic targeting for resources, period. I, I know that I mean, you, you um, mentioned the community-derived aspects of some of the data, but I guess this relationship between community-based data versus facility-based data, is there, is there more to talk about in that respect? So for like even though the DHI system does take into account both the level, the data from the community level and health facilities as well. So routinely uh, CH, uh, uh, VEs and community health uh, uh, assistants and also community health volunteers, they do aggregate uh, health reports from the community level, and then that is turned over to the facilities. The reason why the facilities are the focus point, because that's where we go to collect uh, the data and then entering the DHIS2. But yes, there are, we, we do take into account that, uh, uh, that there are data in the community that has to be uh, uh, transcribed in the DHIS2, and we do account for that uh, in early on in the process. And I'll just yeah. and I'll add to that. Um, the some countries have other data sources in addition to DHIS2 or HMIS data. So there are several countries that have sent community health worker um, data as well on specific indicators. And so that data is going to look different. But um, we have been incorporating that into our dashboards and what we return to sites. Um, and in addition, there's been other sources beyond beyond just community uh, health worker data sources that we've also incorporated in here. So while the focus was on the DHIS2 routinely monthly collected data, we do have um, other sources that we're kind of collating and, and giving back to the sites as well. Okay. I had a question. I, I was fascinated by the, the PLEBO data. It seemed to be an outlier um, where, where everyone was expecting an increase in utilization that had a decrease. And you went through a beautiful process of figuring out confounding factors. I guess, when do you decide that something is signal versus just just noise? And, and then what kind of process do you go with? To go, do you all go through collectively to think through the, these these confounding variables or these or explanations for surprising data? Easy. Do you want to take a shot with Emma? So I won't. I'll speak more broadly than just the the Pluto case. Um, so these methods that are in place are really to do routine monitoring on the monthly basis where while we can't when we see kind of a dip that's below like the predicted interval um, we might we will come up with some hypotheses for why that is happening but we can never say conclusively like that is why it's dipping in this month um, but we will like on those monthly site calls kind of walk through, okay, what are the potential reasons for this dip? Is it a data quality issue? Like, are there just some zeros in the data because it wasn't collected? And then we can, that, that's something we can actually account for. Mm -hmm. um, but if there are other issues due to either stockouts for health service utilization, 
that could also be incorporated um, into the model. Um, but there might just be like other factors that we aren't able to adjust for, but at least we have some explanations for, as Emma gave for the Liberia case and all other countries all have their um, similar hypotheses and stories that, that to address those dips or increases, or even when things are staying the same. Um, yeah, Emma, I don't know if you have additional comments on the Plevo case for one. No, I think what you said is correct. Often when we do see uh, differences over time, we go back and investigate. And I think that's one of the strengths of our team, you know, uh, the Prince and the rest of the team, you know, whenever there's missingness or, you know, a, a reason why we need to address some of the issues, we go back and look at it. And then often we come up, if, if there's missing data, it can be retroactively entered. But like you said, we've accounted for mostly all of the issues with data quality in the Liberia case. And so I think, you know, we'll continuously to do that over time. As we suspect things out of place, we'll go back and investigate and adjust the data if there's a need to. Great. Well, thank you so much to all of you. It's been just really wonderful to see the collaboration that you've established and, and the way that you you're, you're creatively use the data that you have and thank you through how it can be used moving forward, the purposes to which it can be used. So, so thank you all uh, for really just a, a, a wonderful talk. And, and um, I want to let our audience know that our next talk will be through the Pro Seminar Series available to all of you, which is in two weeks on October 14th. And it will be Michelle Morse and Julia Mukherjee um, speaking on the need for critical race and feminist theory and health equity, which certainly uh, is more relevant than ever. So we welcome all of you. That will be noon on October 14th. Um, thank you again to everyone today, and I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.